Well, you have to admit that we are living in fast changing times these days. Seems like things can change in the blink of an eye. I think all of you are aware that uh, Kevin Cortes and Gary Van Osdale are not here with us anymore. But uh, I just want to acknowledge them out of respect. I didn't want to come up here and start giving a message and not giving them that little respect. So they've been with our congregation for many years. All right, today we're going to take a look at one simple scripture, six words. Very simple, easy to understand, short scripture, but they are very important, very important. So let's take a look at Philippians 2 and verse 5, and we'll begin right there. Philippians 2, 5. I'll read this as it's written in the King James Version. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we're going to focus on let this mind be in you. And then we're going to try to more fully comprehend the meaning and understanding of this verse. So we're going to take it a word at a time. That first word is let, which means allow or permit. It denotes that we have a choice. If you let something happen or you permit something to happen, it's your choice that it does or does not. The second word is this. Pretty simple. Webster says this is a thing or person that is near or something specific. And what we're specifically talking about is the third word, which is mind. Our mind, according to Webster's, is our faculty, our whole spiritual nature. You know, you've read there is a spirit of man and there is a spirit of God. And we're talking about today, the spirit of man seeking to follow the spirit of God. The fourth word is be, which simply means to exist. And that fifth word is is in. So we read, let this mind be in you. In simply means within or inside of. And of course, this is the last of the six words is one we all know quite well is you, which is you, one specific individual. And it is to you whom God speaks and God tells us these six words to make clear that our minds ought to be focused with the mind of Christ, that the mind of Christ need be in us, existing with us. And that's done through God's Holy Spirit. So let's look a little further, or think a little further, and glimpse the mind of Christ, what it's talking about here. Philippians 2 beginning in verse 1. It says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, this is about the briefest description of Christ's mind that you're probably going to find in Scripture. And Paul goes on and writes and says, make my joy complete. Now this actually sounds like God speaking, doesn't it? Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Now we've been called to be united in Christ, under Christ. And in order to do that and to be that, we have to have an intimate and personal relationship with him. And from this relationship comes the light to our path. You know, Philippians 2 and verse 1, there is light being shed here. It speaks of love, fellowship with the Spirit, and having tenderness and compassion 
things that are of the mind of Christ. You know, as it says in verse 2, being of the same love as Christ has shown us, and being of the same mind, having the same purpose of thought, and striving to be united in the Spirit of God, intent on that one purpose. You know, <clears throat> if in all our dealings, especially with one another, we're done with this mind in us, there would be no conflicts. This purpose and way of life laid out before us is to love God first and love all else, all others, one another, as Christ loved us. So let's think of ourselves a little bit. Where do we personally, you and I, comply with what it says now in verse 3? There it reads, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. You know, sometimes we let our feelings get in the way and they block that united sense we should have one to another. You know, if you recall in uh, John 1 verse 1, when we think about the mind of Christ, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Christ totally emptied himself regarding us, mankind, ahead of himself. He came and he was sacrificed and died as sin for us. So this is the ultimate love. And we're expected to love one another. A reflection of his mind when God says love one another isn't referring to just our church family. Or he wouldn't have said love your enemies and forgive your enemies and pray for your enemies. All mankind is included in that love for one for another. Next we have verse 5. And we just read that. We understand that. We can see what God is saying. Let's go on to verse 6. Speaking of Christ, who, although he existed in the form of God in the beginning, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He so humbled himself that he did not exalt himself above anybody. Verse 7, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Now, there's humility there that I don't think any of us could possibly match. Verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming ob obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. So God expects us to be obedient unto our death. Now, for this reason, it says in verse 9, for this reason also, because Christ humbled himself, loved others, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. You know, understanding and comprehending and emulating what is meant by let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, the more we dwell on it, the more we think on it, the more we live it, the better we can emulate it. So now, all that was just said was to just get us ready for a question we all ought to ask ourselves, each one of us personally. And that question is, 
Do I have his mind in me? Do I have his mind in me? Can you know? Well, you certainly can. You know, there's a way of self-examination, something we ought to do. Passover's coming up soon, so it's not too soon to start. Something we should be always doing is self-examination. So let's self-examine ourselves on a couple of subjects, a couple of matters. Consider the crisis at our southern border. We have all these different peoples from different lands walking great distances and traveling, trying to come to that border to cross. And what does the carnal mind say about that? The carnal mind says, well, they have their own country. They should go back. The carnal mind says, well, they have different cultures and they have different ways. Carnal mind also says their language is just gibberish and I don't understand it. They just don't fit in. Also says to itself, I don't want them in my neighborhood. The selfish carnal mind says, I prefer things the way they are. They'll just foul things up and consume resources. Now that's carnal thinking. In our self-examination, let's consider what might be the thoughts of Christ on this. He might say, well, these people are like you, with a heart, with feelings, with hopes. Their dreams aren't very big but they sure do want a better life. You can't hold that against them. They've walked for days, even weeks, hungry, poor, dirty, just hoping for a possibility that they may find a better life, that they may find compassion. Now, would not Christ have compassion on them? You know, we can quite well recognize the need of all these people and the cost. But the cost and the logistics of trying to make it happen for them is not our concern. Our concern is what God wants us to be concerned about, that we have his mind in us. You know, we witness the mind of Christ in scripture through his many healings. And He was full of compassion. It's been revealed so many times when he was about to heal. It says on many occasions there that he felt compassion and he was moved by compassion and he had compassion on them and then he healed them. You know, God gave us his spirit which is the power to choose to do this, to have this mind in us. That's why God says, let this mind be in you. It's our choice. You know, there are so many other circumstances in this life before us that challenge us and try the heart and then reveal the heart to God. We're revealing this day whose mind is in us. You know, there's uh, all these homeless people. You know, we see them all over the place. And what does the carnal mind say about them? Oh, just go get a job. Well, how are they going to do that? They're hungry. They can hardly walk. They don't have any underwear. Where are they going to go? Some might, possibly, but they need help. The carnal mind says, well, they just collect garbage and trash, and they trash any area where they congregate. They just simply defile everything where they're at, says the carnal mind. You know, when a person has absolutely nothing, 
everything and anything is valuable, which is why they collect those bits and pieces and things. You know, the carnal would, mind would say, oh, they're just a menace to us. Well, who is us but the more privileged? And this does not make us better than them. Are we better than the homeless because we have and they have not? Now, this does not make us more valuable. I know people who have wound up on the street who, because of an injury or a loss of a mate, lost their house, no place to go. Victims of this age. Should we not have an abundance of compassion, at least in our minds and hearts? You know, God doesn't say, go fix it for him. He expects us to love one another. We're told to be like him. And this is our choice. Let's turn to Colossians 3 and look at verse 12. Colossians 3, 12. Subtitle in my Bible says, Put on the new self. And there in chapter 3, verse 12, it, it reads, So, as though who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's our choice. We can do that. And then let's turn to James 5 and look at verse 12 there. James 5, 12. There it reads, it says, But above all, my brethren, I have just turned to the wrong scripture. Okay, let's look at verse 14. Now, that's not the right one either. Okay. That was in Colossians that we were going to look at. So we're at James 5, verse 11 right now. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings and that the Lord is full of compassion and merciful. Now we're all familiar with Job and know of the plight he had. And we also know that Job was a very wealthy man. In his time, he was one of the most wealthy men of the, of the whole area. And... Job was that way because Job, as you look at chapter 29 of Job, which speaks of his life, that he was a very compassionate man. And he helped many, and his hand blessed many, because he was a man who had love, which is what compassion comes from. You know, the blessings that God offers us should we be that loving and compassionate? Because if you think about it, both the great commandments, love God first, love one another, and against love there is no law. It sounds to me like this is the easy way to go and not worry about where you're going. You know, the blessings that God offers us are far, far greater than Job's blessings. The blessings God's offering us is greatness in the kingdom of God, wealth beyond anything we can imagine. And on top of that, a perfect body and mind that will last for eternity. Surely we can find some love one for another with this hope in mind. You 
know, what we do feel or think about those people at the border, compassion or resentment to those who simply desire a better life. And what do we feel and think about those people who are homeless and poverty stricken, which are victims of this age, is really important. And that way there we can test our own mind, examine our own mind. Where are we with this? We all know ourselves personally. There's room in my life for improvement. I'll be the first to admit that. We've been called to be living witnesses of God's word, which means God's word is seen through us, exposed, lived. That's a witness. And it's important that we examine ourselves and look, see, on whose path did we walk? The carnal man or Christ's path? You know, after being called to repent and then baptized and then given the Holy Spirit with a laying on the hands, which makes us witnesses that God's word is spirit and truth. You know, it's easy to be caught up in the things of this world. Think of the parable of the ten virgins. They all went to sleep. They all went to sleep. Did they lose sight of uh, the mind they are to have in them? Lose connection with God that way, perhaps? Perhaps. You know, we're placed in the body where God chooses to place us. And every member is placed by God. Now, we've had unfortunate in our congregation. We still have unfortunate in our congregation. Do we have love for them? You know, God says choose. And he says choose life. So does our attitude make a difference? Well, isn't it our attitude that makes the difference? Attitudes themselves are an expression from the heart. And before God, nothing is hid. You know, the poor, the destitute, unfortunate, downtrodden, who have virtually nothing, not even hope. This describes people at the border and the homeless. But it also describes the people who are going to be left after the tribulation. They're going to be poor, sick, broken, literally heartless, downtrodden, hiding in the rocks, literally. God says so. They're people just like the people we're talking about today. You know, if we're raised up at Christ's return and we have this carnal mind in us, looking at people with this carnal mind, what value are we going to be? How are we going to pe teach people to love God and to love one another if we have not learned that and developed that today? I know these are kind of strong words. You know, I didn't want to go this way, but, you know, when I sit down and go before God, I don't choose where I go. You know, our people, well, our, our goal is to be kings and priests, and we'll be rulers over people. And what do rulers do but provide for their people and guide their people? You know, we are to be guides to help people learn to love God by living his laws. We will be guides to help and show people how to love one another because we've learned that and we, we experience that and we do it and that's how we know it. You know, we want to be a good measure of value to God to be raised up by God. 
You know, I'd like to repeat that, uh, you know, the second great commandment, God says, love one another. Christ says, love one another, even as I have loved you. Well, Christ loved everybody. Nobody was in the church at that time. That love that God expects us to have is for all, even our enemies. That's why I say forget about the logistics of who's going to pay for it and how to make it happen. We can't solve that. We don't have an answer for that because we don't have the power or the place or the means. But we do have the power to choose whose mind is in us. You know, if you think about what God said about Satan that, you know, he's going to be cast back down to the earth and be and wage war with the woman, which is the church. God also speaks of Satan, and you see it in Genesis that he was called a serpent and the most subtle. He was very subtle. Now he is waging war with the saints. And I don't think he's waiting for the tribulation to make his efforts at us, the saints. All these circumstances we look at that we just talked about, and there are many others, are probably placed there by Satan. That's his work. That's not God's work. And if he can trap us into thinking and looking at these people with the carnal mind, then he's got us. We'll fall short. There are so many things going on today to take time to think about them and think it through. But we need to ask ourselves, where are we? Am I going to sleep? I have to wonder about myself sometimes. I don't want to go to sleep as what we know about the ten virgins. You know, God says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And we ask ourselves, well, do I have this mind in me? Well, we've been given the power to choose. We can see what God's mind is all about, at least enough of it that shows us what we need to be all about. We just need to remember that against love, there is no law. And so at Christ's return, if we have that love, if we have that godly love, then you have no need to doubt or fear.